Welcome to this meditation about creation, about the beginning of our world. In this meditation on creation, we, we should be quite sure about one thing, and that is that there is not a clash between modern science and religion. Some people are quite disturbed by this. They think they have to choose between one or the other. But they shouldn't clash. They deal with different areas. Science deals with the physical world that we can measure. Religion deals with God and our relationships with God. And so they should work together, supporting one another. After you have watched the video, then once again enter into the message that it contains. That God has given us this beautiful world to look after, to preserve. And we should thank Him for it. And we should undertake to really try and save our world from destruction. The Bible tells us that in the beginning there was water, a vast ocean, and over this ocean there was darkness and chaos. This is all described in Hebrew as tohu wa bohu. However, the Spirit of God was hovering over the deep like a great bird. Then God said, Let there be light, and light came to be. One of the most remarkable things in the creation story is the sovereign ease with which God does His work. His word is so powerful that He just speaks and what He says comes to be. The work of creation is arranged according to a pattern. There were three days of separation, then three days of decoration. On the first day, God separated the light from the darkness. Then he separated the waters so that there was water above and water below, with our world in between. On the third day, he separated the sea from the dry land and caused the earth to produce trees and plants. On the fourth day, he decorated the sky with the great lights, the sun, the moon and the stars. Then he decorated our world with the fish and the birds. On the sixth day, he brought forth the cattle, the other animals and mankind. On the seventh day, he rested. Not that he needed to rest, but to teach us to take time off for God from the rush of life, which happily you are doing by making this meditation. This obviously is not meant to be a modern account of evolution and we make a mistake if we try and line it up with modern evolution, which let us remember is only a theory. God created fish in their millions, all of them beautiful and of so many different colors. This fish is a dugong and is found in the waters of northern Australia. It is very slow and its flesh is delicious to eat. As a result, unfortunately, it seems to be heading for extinction. Here we see India's pride and joy, the peacock. Perhaps it was one of God's jokes that such a beautiful bird has such a raucous, strident cry. Some pelicans at rest. There is a story about the pelican that in times of starvation it would peck its breast to draw blood and feed its young. This is taken as a symbol of Christ who gives life to us by feeding us with his divine, spiritual body and blood. The elephant is surely a most wondrous creature. Did it evolve by evolution? If we agree that the extraordinary powers of evolution basically come from God and his wisdom, 
then we can agree. If on the other hand we wish to place science and evolution on a pedestal in place of God, then I think it is time to say no. No process of blind evolution without intelligent design could ever produce anything like an elephant. At last the time came for God to create man. In this picture by Michelangelo, we see the moment when God sent his spirit into the man and made him a living person. The artist wonderfully conveys a sense of dependence, how God is the source of our life. The man was made in the image and likeness of God himself. It was his duty to oversee the creation. There was peace among all the creatures. In this painting by Jan Bruegel, we see God leading all the animals to Adam for him to name them, which gave him authority over them all. But among all the animals, man did not find a mate worthy of himself. According to the story of the Bible, God put the man into a deep sleep and from one of his ribs he made a woman. Adam recognized her as his equal, rejoicing, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. The rib story is not meant to show that Adam is superior to Eve, but precisely that they are equal. The painting shows the tenderness and love with which God created Eve. Adam and Eve lived together in perfect happiness in the garden which God had made for them, a garden of delight. They were completely innocent and did not wear clothes. They could eat of everything in the garden except the fruit of the tree of knowledge. They were not God and needed to show that they accepted this by obeying this light law of God. Truth demanded that they accept God as God. They used to associate lovingly and freely with God when he came to walk with them in the garden in the cool of the evening. God had also made a vast host of spirits, powerful intellectual beings not tied to a body. Some had accepted God and served Him, others did not. There was a great war in heaven and the archangel Michael defeated the leader of the rebels known as Lucifer or Satan. Satan was thrown down to the earth determined to wreck God's plans. Taking the form of a serpent, Satan came to Eve and began to sow doubts in her mind about God himself. This is perhaps the root of all sin. We come to doubt about God and look for fullness elsewhere. Satan told Eve that if she ate the fruit, she would become equal to God. Eve looked at the fruit of the tree of knowledge and thought that it looked good. She ate some of it and gave it to her husband for him to eat, which he did. Immediately their eyes were opened and they saw that they were naked. By refusing to accept God as God, they had broken their relationship with him, a relationship which had to be founded on truth. Their original innocence, joy and love were destroyed. The garden of delight which God had given them was a beautiful symbol of their relationship with God. But since that relationship 
was broken, their life in the garden also came to an end. They left the garden, and we are told an angel of the Lord stood guard there with a flaming sword. We are not meant to take all the details of these accounts literally. This is not strict history in the modern sense, but salvation history. It uses primitive history to tell us about God and how we should relate to Him. Once outside the garden, their life became a life of hardship, suffering and death. tells us sin came into the world through one man and death through sin and so death spread to all men because all men have sinned. This terrible and fearful painting by Jan Bruegel is called the triumph of death. In the distance we see burning cities and ships sinking in the sea. New crowds of people are being brought to the site of death where people are being killed in all manner of ways. The poles with cartwheels on top were used as a medieval form of execution. The victim was tied to the wheel, raised up and left to die of hunger and thirst and to be attacked by the birds. A skeleton on horseback is herding people into a great box. People are being cut to death, dragged, hacked and hung. The king is taking a last look at his gold, but a skeleton waves an hourglass at him, telling him his time is up. There is a cardinal in the foreground, since death respects no one. This is the state the human race has been reduced to by sin, by rejecting the gentle rule of God. But even then, God promised to send a Redeemer. God made man and woman in his own image and likeness and appointed them to look after his creation. Sadly, we, the human race, are not doing this very well. This coal mine is a typical example of how we are exploiting and are destroying God's creation to satisfy our own greed. All of God's gifts come down to us like the waters of the giant waterfall at Iguazu in South America. It is for us to enjoy them and use them wisely according to the will of God and not in a blind passion of greed. This is what our world should resemble, a beautiful, clean lake covered with lotus flowers. <laughs> 